Vote now on our poll. If you stand up in your living room and swear allegiance to the king, are you A, patriotic or B, idiotic? You can vote on my Twitter, on YouTube, on my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway, or on the YouTube community poll. I want a big number on this poll, which is my intention and why I'm mentioning it right up top in the show. Apparently, we're supposed to chant in our own homes, in an act of state worship, may the king live forever. Well, I will not be doing that for a number of reasons. Secondly, I will not be watching the coronation and therefore will have no idea when I would be supposed to chant it. Secondly, it is an idea absolutely unholy. May nobody live forever. Living forever is an ungodly plea, an ungodly ambition. Everyone must live and everyone must die, including Prince Charles. And thirdly, although I could go on, believe me, I have no allegiance to the man that will be crowned king. A golden hat put on his head at a cost of 250 million pounds in austerity racked Britain. A man not fit to wear the crown. And that's a view held by many people. I shall go through them. But the main point is that even if he was a paragon of virtue, even if he was an Olympian model of beauty and grace and intellect, I would still regard the idea of crowning someone king of all his subjects, because that's what we are, not citizens, on the basis, accidental basis, of birth, when in fact, if Princess Anne, a much more suitable candidate for the crown if we are to have one, would not have been crowned even if she had been born before Prince Charles on the grounds of primogeniture. The male in the line comes first. I think the idea of monarchy is an infantilizing idea. I know that many of my viewers do not agree. Many of them look across the Atlantic at the Banana Republic presided over by Joe Biden and say, no thanks. But that's a false dichotomy. We have no need to reject monarchy and go for an executive presidency. We have no need to go for a political presidency of any kind. We can have an entirely titular, representative head of state, but one chosen by us. Not even necessarily directly chosen by the parliament and the regional assemblies, chosen by the local authorities, chosen by a panel of a thousand citizens. Any kind of election would be fine by me. But the idea that just for an accident, Prince Andrew, bosom buddy of Jeffrey Epstein, and under some surprising bosom buddies, of Jeffrey Epstein emerging on social media, at least today. Noam Chomsky, anyone? He says it's none of our business that he was a bosom buddy of Jeffrey Epstein. I think it's in the public interest that we should know this myself, but I digress. The point is, this accident of birth system could easily have given us Prince Andrew as king next Saturday. Arise, King Andrew. Oops, he's already arisen, but at least he's not sweating. The whole idea is entirely ridiculous. But for overseas viewers in particular, let me summarize why it is likely that the man being crowned at the cost of 250 million pounds next Saturday will be the last, will bring the increasingly discredited idea of monarchy in Britain crashing to a halt. There's a critical mass of people who don't want him, who don't feel any allegiance to him, and who would regard, therefore, any such pledge 
as being entirely hypocritical. The smallest number would be people like me, who are against monarchy in principle. But add to them the new constituencies of which I speak. First of all, this man conducted a decades-long adulterous affair with an adulterous woman who's invited her husband, who was cuckolded by Charles, to the crowning of King Charles. How's that for a crowning glory? Camilla Parker Bowles is now our queen in defiance of assurances given repeatedly to the British Parliament when I was sitting there watching and listening to what was being said. She'll never be the queen, they said. She'll be the queen consort. Well, she was for a few months, but now from Saturday, she's the queen. She ain't no queen, bruv. She cheated on her husband for decades, and Charles cheated on his wife for decades. But although Mr. Parker Bowles has survived, maybe even relieved, to be shot of her, no such luck accompanied Princess Diana. She was driven mad, mad by this adulterous affair. She tried to commit suicide. It destroyed her, and she was killed in remarkable circumstances. I believe indirectly related to the way that Prince Charles, as he then was, treated her. So everybody in Britain that loved Diana, and believe me, that was many more millions than ever loved Charles, cannot accept Camilla Parker Bowles as their queen, and cannot accept the man whose conduct indirectly led to the death of Diana as their king. There's another new constituency. As it's turned out, although I have always known it, Prince Charles is a globalist stooge. He is a man in thrall to the alphabet soup, W-E-F, W-H-O, U-N-O, any fad, any new thing, he fastens onto it with an extraordinary gusto, even when there is no basis for it, and even when his now subjects are increasingly opposed to it. His statement, for example, in the German uh, Bundestag just a couple of weeks ago, made it clear he was wholly opposed to Britain leaving another of his favorite acronyms, the EU. But it's not his business to be for or against Britain leaving the EU. That was our business, and we decided it. And for the man who's supposed to be our king to go abroad and disrespect the will of the British people, worst of all in Berlin, in the Bundestag, was an affront. His kissing and cuddling, cavorting, rubbing cheeks with Klaus Schwab, with the Greta Thunbergs, with the faddists of the climate change issue, the faddists of gender change, the faddists of LGBTQ++++ is anathema to millions of Charles's subjects who would once have been the loyal monarchists that they were during the reign of his mother, Queen Elizabeth. A woman just wrote on my social media, I was a royalist, and then the Queen died, and that was that. And I think that that feeling is abroad, widespread in Britain. And I'll get a better idea of that when I see what you are voting on what is turning out to be a bumper poll on all the platforms that I have mentioned. I'm dedicating this show uh, to the two great events that occurred on this day, and not coincidentally. The greatest and most important of them took place in Berlin on this day in 1945. The banner of victory was hoisted over the rubble 
of the German capital of Berlin, which was intended to be the center of a 1,000-year Reich, in which all Jews would have been annihilated, in which all Slavs would have been annihilated, all gay people, all disabled people, all people with mental illness, all Jehovah Witnesses, all adherents of any ideology or religion that challenged the idea of Hitler fascism and his allies, Mussolini in Italy and Tojo in Japan, who brought about the deaths of a hundred million people almost in the course of their rule. A rule which was intended to last, as I say, for a thousand years. What could be more of a debt which any country, any people could owe than the debt we owe to the men that raised that banner over the Reichstag and the army from which they came, which at the cost of Unbelievable sacrifice, 26 million Soviet citizens died, predominantly Russians, but all the former republics of the Soviet Union made up a Red Army, made up a civilian defense force, made up a force of partisans, made up a workforce whose military industrial production made possible the victory of the Red Army on this day in 1945. How much more could you owe somebody than to have defeated the genocidal maniacs who might otherwise still be ruling your country and mine, who might otherwise have still us under their jackboot, might still be operating their gas chambers, and their concentration camps. What more could any country owe than a debt of gratitude to the people that liberated us? There was an old man, almost a 100 years old, in Poland last week, in front of the Polish Prime Minister and other grandees of the Polish state, listening to them talking about the victory of the Allies, the liberation of the camps, without ever mentioning the Russian army, the Red Army. So he, when the microphone was passed to him, as the last remaining survivor of the Warsaw Uprising, when the Jewish ghetto rose up against the fascist beasts that massacred four million of them, Jews and non-Jews in Poland, four million had been massacred. And he made two very important points that you will never see on any syllabus or ever hear on any so-called mainstream media. He said, we were massacred by Poles, by Ukrainians, as well as Germans. And secondly, he said, I don't know what history books you've been reading. I was liberated by the Soviet Red Army and nobody else. Can you imagine how well that went down amongst the Polish grandees who seek to rewrite history, who seek to forgive the mass murderers and give them weapons and take money from them. Weapons to the Ukrainians, money from the Germans, thank you very much. Who seek to forgive the perpetrators of the Holocaust in the East and West and demonize the very people whose victory meant their liberation, whose efforts liberated those camps and those remaining Jews and others who were dying, starving, and at risk of annihilation uh, within them. I could talk all night on these matters, as you know, but I will quickly move on to this. Also on this day, the Vietnamese people smashed down the gates of the American embassy in what was then called Saigon, now Ho Chi Minh City. 
smashed down the gates. The American diplomats, journalists, so-called, and other factotums were escaping from the roof in a helicopter, many of which fell from the sky. So many were on board and so many of the factotums were kicked into the dust and told their services to the United States Empire were no longer required. This victory of Ho Chi Minh, General Giap, and the millions of women and men, fighters, in the North Vietnamese Army and in the Viet Cong in South Vietnam, is one that so many of our people now know nothing about. It was my bread and butter. I followed it hourly every day of my young life. This victory on this day in 1975 was the happiest day I can recall in my entire life. Yet so many have forgotten it, not least in the United States of America, which is hardly surprising. They've forgotten the truth about the Second World War. They've forgotten what happened in the Korean War. They've forgotten what happened in the Vietnam War. My goodness, they've even forgotten what happened when the Taliban routed them just two years ago and they had to steal from the country like thieves in the night. I'm talking of thieves in the night. The Scottish police have intensified their investigation into the ruling party in my country, the separatist, nationalist, so-called Scottish nationalist party have intensified their investigation, now widened it into something so dark that if established, if it leads to charges, if it leads to a conviction, it will be the death of that nationalist party and hopefully the death of their hateful, narrow-minded bigotry. It's this. The police are investigating whether or not people who left millions of pounds in their will, well-meaning people who left money in their will to the SNP thinking they were doing something good for the cause they believed in, separate independence for Scotland, may have had that money falsely used, may have had that money criminally purloined. It is leading now the Scottish national media and the newspapers, not yet on the television, they'll be last to report it. But in the Sunday Mail Daily Record, the Scottish edition of, of the Daily Mirror, Sunday Mirror in Scotland, they've got the receipts. And my goodness, how damning are they? Because if true, what this represents is grave robbing that Burke and Hare might have had the grace to be ashamed of. Fasten your seatbelts. I told you, it's going to be a bumpy night. It's the mother of all talk shows after all.